you. Thank you. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Um, Love you too. Thank you. Um, it is an honor to be on the stage with you, my friend. Uh, everyone in this room is just so um, incredibly inspired and proud of what you accomplished. And um, so much of what could have happened um, afterwards, um, people wouldn't have blamed you to sort of go back and, and you know, sit, sit down for a while and take some time and spend some time thinking. And, um, but you did what you've been doing for so many years. You went back and thought about the infrastructure that was required to channel the voices of everyday people to make the system work for everyone. And why don't you talk to us a little bit about Fair Fight and about the effort that you are building to um, really ensure that we build the type of power to change the system so that we can win on the issues that we've been talking about today. Right. Thank you. Yes. Well, first I have to say thank you for the uncoordinated support that you all gave me. <laughs> um, uh, in, in campaign finance parlance, <laughs> thank you for what you did. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you all for being here. I, I want to start by saying that in 2013, we launched the New Georgia Project, uh, an organization that was designed to register the 800,000 unregistered people of color in the state of Georgia, because we knew that those voices would be silent, would, would be silent until someone asked them to lift their voices up. That was the first piece of what I saw as necessary to get them involved in the body politic. Second piece was the work I did as Democratic leader, but when I ran for governor, we built an election protection system that had not been built in Georgia before. We anticipated that there would be you know, chicanery and shenanigans. I did not realize I was going to be running against a cartoon villain. <laughs> and in the process, we uncovered just layers of malfeasance and incompetence that created a seamless web of voter suppression. In response, uh, you know, I spent the, the interim 10 days between the election and my non-concession day, as we call it. Uh, in fact, someone outside asked if I'm ever going to concede. The answer is no. Um, <laughs> the the non-concession day. <laughs> we spent those 10 days really understanding what had happened. And so there was no alternative but to on the next day, on November 17th, but to launch Fair Fight. Fair fight is very simple. It is a fight for democracy in Georgia and, and America. Voter suppression is real, voter fraud is a lie, and we have to restore electoral integrity if we want to save our democracy. We approach it with three things. We approach it in three ways. One is litigation. We have filed a comprehensive federal lawsuit that likens our approach to Brown versus the Board of Education, saying that even though the laws on the books are technically legal, they are unconstitutional in their operation and therefore must be struck down. And that you, when you yoke those together, you create a system of voter suppression that disenfranchises voters in violation of the Constitution. Two, we're pushing for legislation, both pro-legislation and trying to kill terrible bills, like a bill that's about to spend $150 million, the most ever spent in the country, on voting machines we know don't work. Uh, and happened to benefit the new governor's chief of staff and general counsel, uh, and the company they worked for just before they became uh, these jobs. And then the third piece is advocacy, talking about why the, what issues actually animate elections. And that's what Fair Fight does. That's great. Um, so, you know, there's a, oh, I'm having a microphone down. Great. So there is a, um, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Perfect. So there's a, um, like a convention of wisdom around, Jode, what does it take to sort of win statewide? What does it take for Democrats to um, get voters who are not of color, uh, to get white voters? Um, and you know, a lot of what we try to talk about at Color of Change is how do we expand our base? How do we motivate everyday people to action? What is the, um, the story we tell, the motivating factors, and the um, pact that we make with our people? And so the race uh, that you ran in Georgia, um, not leaving people behind, 
talking clearly about um, not just uh, black folks who have such a deep and long history in the South, but talking about newer immigrants, um, talking about LGBT people who have become more visible um, as our country has changed. And uh, the, um, the, the clear choice that you made to run a different type of campaign, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Can you talk about some of the incentive structures and the wins that were against those type of decisions? Well, the first win was I'm a black woman, and that's kind of hard. Uh, and so, and <laughs> In our primary, we began the primary building for the general election. And there's an arrogance to that. There's an audacity to that. Uh, but there's also a necessity. We had watched for the last 15 years candidates stand for office and run the same campaign over and over again. Try to convince the same people who not only broke up with us, but took the car, took the house, took the kids. <laughs> you know, trying to convince them that, but, you, but baby, you still love me. They don't. <laughs> and so, my approach was that you not only had to expand the electorate, you had to transform the conversation. And so the first step was that we, during the primary, intentionally centered communities of color, marginalized communities, and talked about their issues, uh, talked about how their identities were impacting their ability to achieve opportunity and access and autonomy. Because if you don't see someone, you can't help them. We talked about the disabled community. We talked about communities that normally do not hear themselves in the body politics, certainly not in primaries. And we did so not only by having the conversation, we actually built infrastructure for this. We hired canvassers. We can, I was the first candidate to ever participate in the gay pride parade. Because you can't just say I support you if you don't show up. We were the first ones to convene a disabled council to advise us to make certain it wasn't just about having someone who could do interpretation at an event, it was making sure that our website was, was, was sufficient, that when people saw our videos, that people felt that they could be included. It was, we were the first campaign to do a bilingual canvas in Georgia. And so we built infrastructure that intentionally centered these communities and said, not only do we see you, but we're investing in you. The second thing was that when we got to the general, because it worked, we won the primary with 76% of the vote, despite being opposed very dramatically by folks within the party. And then we get to the general, we've already built the infrastructure. So when we convene the first Latino roundtable of reporters to tell them, here's what we're doing and help us get this done, and we're going to put money into your papers, we're going to buy ads from you. We did that with the Muslim community. We did that with African Americans, with the AAPI community. We went to every county. There are 159 counties in Georgia. I went to all 159 counties. We had staff in the entire state. And we put money behind that. We raised more money than any campaign in Georgia history. And we spent it on Georgians. And by doing so, we were able to demonstrate that our investment wasn't just tacit, it was intentional. Uh, but what yoked everything together was that we talked about issues the same to everybody. So I talked about economic security, educational opportunity, and expansion of access to healthcare. So whether I was talking to you in rural Georgia on your farm, or in Midtown Atlanta, or in Valdosta, in a black community that has been ravaged by a hurricane, I sounded the same. But what was different was that I was able to tie together the identity that people knew was causing their barriers to the opportunity that would come with my election. And by doing so, we tripled Latino turnout in Georgia. We tripled Asian Pacific Islander turnout. We increased youth participation rates by 139%. We increased African-American participation by 40%. And just to put that in context, in 2014, 1.1 million Democrats voted. In 2018, 1.2 million black people voted for me. And, and then just the, the underlying issue to what you said is that people thought that doing those things would isolate us from the white community. That, by, that there is a zero-sum game of every person of color I added, I would lose a white voter. Every marginalized community I lifted up, I would lose a traditional or normative voter. We increased the white participation rates for Democrats for the first time in 25 years. Um, I received more votes than any other Democrat, and I received more votes than any Democrat in Georgia history. You know, and so much about what's happening today is about how do we 
move to a framework of talking about the rules, right? And so much of your campaign, and, and which was why we were so proud to, you know, do the uncoordinated work in support, um, <laughs> you know, was because um, we were not just telling a story, and we say this, a, we talk about this a lot at Color of Changes, not just telling a story of the unfortunate, but telling a story of the unjust. Leaving people at unfortunate m leaves people in a charitable space mm -hmm. of how do I do mentorship? How do I send water bottles to Flint? Or clean up an inner city school instead of changing public education? And you know, throughout your campaign, you talked about the rules. Um, can, you know, as you ran this race and you heard the feedback on the trail, I'd be interested um, if you could share with folks here, what were some of the sort of feedback as you introduced policies and as you sort of were clear about what you were trying to accomplish, what were some of the things that were sort of most compelling or was there anything that was surprising? Sure. First policy we introduced was advanced energy jobs. Talking about climate change in the deep south is hard. Uh, talking about the environment is difficult. But what people wanted to understand was, yeah, things are bad, but one, what does that have to do with me? And two, what can I do about it? So we talked about it in terms of advanced energy jobs. So number one, you care about it because you can make some money from fixing it. Because people want to know how are they going to take care of themselves and their families. So if I was in North Georgia, which is largely white, largely rural, I would talk about advanced energy jobs because there's wind in them, their hills. And if we could harness wind, those are jobs so that your children don't have to move across the state line to get a better job. Because that's an area that's been ravaged by the opioid crisis and by economic downturns. If I'm down near the farmlands, you can turn your farms, you can lease that land that you're not using because you're in crop rotation, you can use that for solar farming. And you can put solar panels on that land and you can make money while you sleep, which you normally cannot do as a farmer. And so here's how that works. And so we really tried to take these broader constructs and talk about the justice piece, but always yoke it back to what they needed personally for their lives to be better. Uh, we did the same thing with Medicaid expansion, which gets pushed as a socialist idea. It's not socialism, it's justice and humanity uh, to make sure people have access to health care. And so in conservative circles, and I had the exact same conversation with the Georgia Chamber of Commerce that I had with the uh, National Co Coalition of Domestic Workers. We need Medicaid expansion because number one, it's the only moral thing to do. Number two, when you lose a rural hospital, you lose 30% of your economic capacity in that county at minimum. Three, people shouldn't die from a stroke because it takes two hours to get to a doctor. And number four, it creates jobs. If you expand Medicaid, 500,000 people get coverage, but more importantly, we create thousands of jobs throughout the state of Georgia, good paying jobs that don't go anywhere because people will always get sick. And if we can put money into the system, you get construction jobs. And so again, it's taking these large constructs of social justice, but tying it back to what people need to see for their lives and how you can make their lives better. And the last one I'll use is childcare. Uh, the second policy we put out was about childcare. You cannot work well if you have to spend a quarter of your income on your child. And a two-year-old should not cost the same as a college education. And in Georgia, we have extraordinarily high childcare costs. And so again, when they would push back and say, well, this is a poor person's issue, I'm like, no. Georgia, and across the state of Georgia, thousands, millions of Georgians could not afford childcare, which means somebody's not working or not working for what they need because they're trying to make the decision of can we afford to take a job and also afford childcare. You solve the childcare issue, you have a more productive workforce. People aren't leaving work in the middle of the day. You can solve at least one moment of traffic in, Georgia, in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> But the, the child care has to be, again, seen as a moral issue because our children should have access and opportunity from the moment they arrive. But it's also about the economics of making sure that parents can make choices about moving their families forward and not just tread water. Um, you mentioned earlier on, you know, kind of offhand, like, you know, running as a black woman. And, and I, I, I want to uh, dig into that because having to show up before voters and put yourself before voters and having them decide who's a leader, who can lead, who should lead, um, what are the symbols that we've held dearly about, um, about what's possible for, for different folks. And um, you know what was so inspiring about so many of the stories we heard 
about the people that were showing up with us to support your effort, about what it said to them about their own lives, and what it said to them about what was possible for them and people in their families. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested, um, you know, as, as you uh, sort of think about what you want to do next, um, and as you think about, and you know, I may ask a more direct question on that. Um, who knows? <laughs> um, um, don't give me a mic. Um, <laughs> Um, but as you think about, like, specifically, you know, um, building this infrastructure, as you think about coming off this campaign, um, what has the, um, the sort of attention to your brand, who you are, um, meant to you? Um, you know, in having to show up where people can respond in all different types of ways. So I, 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 Chelsea Hall, who's here, uh, has been with me every step of the way. She's heard me describe it this way, and I think she cringes a little bit each time I say it, but I basically ran my campaign, I call it the Eight Mile Campaign. Uh, if you saw the movie Eight Mile, <laughs> she's from Detroit, so she really cringes. She's from Atlanta and Detroit. So if you remember the last rap battle that Rabbit does, um, <laughs> yes, this is the erudition that I bring to my campaign. Yes. Uh, <laughs> But if you remember the last rap battle, he said, you know, he, he basically lays out all of the attacks that he anticipates against him. He talks about and deconstructs, you know, the social and class constructs that are going to be used to accuse him of not being sufficient. And he says, yeah, now tell these folks, you know, what you've got to tell these folks, you know, what else do you have to say about me? My campaign was grounded in that. Look, I'm a, I'm a sturdy black woman. You cannot miss me. I have natural hair, and I'm not planning to do anything about that either. I dress the way I want to dress, and I'm going to talk about the issues that animate me because that's why I do this. I also happened to, you know, when I launched this campaign, I was in a lot of debt. Uh, I had faced, I have a brother who is in and out of the penal system. Uh, we, I had to make complicated choices as Democratic leader. And all of those are going to be part of my packaging. When I think about brand, my brand is that you just have to be transparent. You don't tell people all your business, mm -hmm. but you've got to be authentic so that they can see themselves in your leadership. They don't have to share every part of your identity, but they have to know that you respect that identity matters and that their identities are also going to matter. And if you can demonstrate that, I mean, I, I, I like to say I'm, you know, I'm lesbian adjacent. I, you know, I'm not, I'm straight, but most, you know, my, my campaign manager, um, she and I would tease each other about this, that, you know, she's like, look, I could find you a date if you would just go ahead and change tea. I'm like, but as you know, being gay is not a choice. Yeah, yeah. It is who you but are. I could, I could <laughs> too. I could help with that too. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but part of that conversation was about the fact that there, there were questions about yeah. who I was. Yeah. And, and what I wanted people to understand is you can show up for people who may not share exactly who you are. But if you are yourself when you show up, they will trust that you will show up for them. And that that's the way we win. That's the way we have these bold conversations. One of the things that's in the news, I did a TV hit on it this morning, and, and, um, and, and it's you know, pivoting to a conversation around affirmative action is what's happened with these elite schools and the sort of gaming of the system. <laughs> Um, the, the different door that the rich and wealthy walk through versus the rest of us. And, and the sort of inadequacy at times of even the rules that we are sort of trying to defend, yeah. right? Um, and the standard that we have to, as people may attack things like affirmative action, what is the standard for equity? I'm interested as you think about the new rules, um, you know, beyond sort of what you were running on, the other sort of over the hill rules that help us sort of think about um, what do we, um, how do we deal with the fact that um, inequality is baked into um, so many of the systems that we hold dear. And even when this sort of news story comes out and people sort of act surprised or say that they're surprised, um, you, know, uh, you know, underneath it, there's not always the same sort of push and discussion to um, fix the system just to punish the folks that have been caught. Right. I, my fundamental belief is that change only happens when you overwhelm the system with difference. And that's why I focus so heavily not only voter registration and the work we're going to do with Fair Fight on 
ending voter suppression, but we've also launched a new organization, we're launching it uh, publicly in the next couple of weeks, called Fair Count. Uh, the census is coming up in 2020, and we all sort of say, yes, it's coming up, and we know about reapportionment and redistricting, but it's also how we allocate all of our money. And there are communities that do not count. They literally are ignored, and therefore their needs are not serviced. And that allows for inequality to be baked in, because when, you're vo when you are literally not counted, you do not count. You cannot have a say in the body politic. You cannot choose your leaders. We cannot wait for goodness to come down from you know, the skies like manna from heaven. It's not going to work that way. What happens is that you rise up and you demand it because you overwhelm them with your numbers. I live in a state and in, in, in a region that has long been used as the archetype for inequality. And I'm not satisfied with that. I don't accept that as a, as a native good. I don't think that that's what has to happen. You must be from the South. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people dismissively say, oh, yeah, it's Mississippi or Alabama. Like, we're supposed to be this way. No, it's because we've allowed injustice to take root and then to spawn seeds. And, it, and it's, in, it's not right. But I'm not waiting for those who benefit from that system to suddenly decide that they, they were wrong. They haven't done it in 400 years. I don't think it's going to change. <laughs> but what can change is who is there now and how do we use our demographic changes but also our technology changes to assert ourselves and demand more. The people who got caught might get punished, but what's happening is that everybody who didn't get caught in the sting is celebrating that their child's getting an education that they don't have to pay for that way. And they're figuring out the next way exactly. that they can do the next thing so they don't get exactly. caught um, exactly. down the line. Yeah. I, I went to Spelman College undergrad. So I went to a black woman's college. I went to grad school at UT Austin, which is about the size of the city I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Yale Law School. You could not have three more divergent experiences. I, I went to Texas for grad school, but I didn't stay for law school because the Hopwood decision came down. And if you remember Hopwood, that was the decision that eliminated affirmative action in the Texas system. And I went from possibly being one of a few hundred in a class with you know, a few hundred people of color in a class to being one of possibly 50 in a class of 400. That's ridiculous. And I figured if I'm going to be at a school that is that uh, melanin light, I'll go to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> And a very good friend of mine, Matt, and I met at Yale. We went to, and I got an extraordinary experience, education there, but I was not a person of privilege. And I had never seen privilege like that. I do not deny the legitimacy of anyone's admission there, but there were often questions about mine. And the reality is there is nothing that happened yeah. in this sting that's going to make people start to rethink whether they should question the legitimacy of my admission to Yale Law School. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait for that to be the, a change. Absolutely. Um, I'm a New Yorker. Um, I, like to, I, like to go, I like to spend time in the South, got family from the South, great migration. Um, but in New York, we have to have uh, snow boots because it snows a lot. Um, and I don't know if you have to have snow boots in Georgia, but no. you need them in, <laughs> but you, you need snow boots in Iowa and New Hampshire. And so I'm interested. Um, that was clever. I'm that was interested very in. Um, in like, I like to shop. So uh, if like uh -huh. you need someone to go shopping for snow boots with uh -huh. you, I'm like down for that. Thank you. But, but uh, is there any like desire to get some snow boots? I believe one must have versatile apparel. Well played. Because you universe. never know what's going to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. But just in but, case but, I wear size 12. Okay, all right, okay, okay. Yes, um, I like that. Um, you know, but, but as you think, right, beyond, as you think about Georgia and what you're building from an infrastructure perspective, and obviously traveling the country and talking about your race and talking to um, people who are hearing the message that you're sharing and are inspired by you, inspired by um, what you offer, and inspired by the unapologetic way that you, um, have not left people behind. Um, I'm, I'm interested in sort of what are the things that you think about um, as you think about what to run next? What are the sort of boxes that you have to check, the, uh, the, um, the gut checks that you have with yourself internally and the people around you? Sure. Number one, I, I don't believe you run for office simply because an office is available. Uh, politics, you know, being in office is a job, and you need to be the right person for the job. 
and you need to want to do that job, not that job as a stepping stone to the next job. You need to want to do that job because there's no guarantee that anything else is going to come. And so for me, the, the, the rubric I'm using, and I'm really, I am thinking about it in segments. I'm thinking about whether to run for the Senate or not because I had not thought about running for the Senate. It has never, honestly, it had never occurred to me. I'd been focused on running for governor and I had a very clear understanding of what that job was, why I would be good at it, what I knew how to do. I'd not thought about the Senate. The Senate is different and it, it is difficult to pass laws. It's not impossible, but it's difficult whether you're in the majority or the minority but it is an extraordinary platform from which to have conversations that we need to have, to have a conversation about voter suppression, to talk about tax policy, which is my bailiwick, to talk about healthcare and education and economic security and rural broadband and the fact that the internet costs too much for almost everybody and that it should be considered the same as any other type of utility and we need to make sure that access is available. There, there, this, there's this range of conversation that needs to happen and the Senate is an extraordinary place to stand and have that conversation. And I need to decide if I'm the person to have that conversation, if that's the best, highest and best use of what I want to do. Being governor matters to me because especially in the South, we have long been governed by people who had extraordinary power, but were not concerned about the people that they governed. And in the South, often the most effective progressive leaders actually run for federal office because usually they end up in Congress and they, they do good work. I mean, I, I live in the home of, of John Lewis. He's an extraordinary leader, but he's on the federal level. And when that happens, it means you're losing people who are on the state level doing that work. You can still make that work happen, and he has done a great job at it, but I have to be very thoughtful about whether I'm better served with the issues I care about and the people I care about doing it from Georgia. Because when you do something in Georgia, you're not doing just Georgia. You're doing Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. You're, do, you're touching the South. And the, the region is my home. And so I have to think about that. And then there's this other job apparently that's coming. Uh, I would argue it's currently vacant, but. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is an important dynamic to having your name considered as part of the national conversation because someone like me is not often on that list. Uh, and I refuse to reject the idea because I don't look like what folks are used to. Uh, and with all due respect to everyone else in the race, I bring something to the table too. Yeah. And I did win my election, I just didn't get to have the job. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so for me, th that, that conversation is, an, is a very distinct and separate one because it's a lot of work and you have to be committed to you know, two marathons and then a triathlon to do this. And I have to be, I have to believe that again, I'm the right person for the job, that it's the right time for me, and that it is the best way for me to serve the issues that matter to me. Thank you. Um, I think that there's a lot of folks that will be waiting uh, to, to see what happens next. Um, but in the last um, sort of two minutes of our time, um, we are in a room full of, um, you know, organizers, researchers, academics, advocates who are every single day trying to think about how to um, sort of advance the, the policies that will change the way people live, how to build the power to get us there, uh, how to change the narrative and the framework, the mental models and the rules and norms of society about what people think are possible and what people think are acceptable. And for, for as someone who's operated both on the inside and the outside, um, but whose, um, you know, whose work on the inside to take these voices and, and, and turn it into policy and take these ideas and turn it into policy, what um, do you have to say to this audience in your sure. close? What is your sort of recommendation as we go out in this moment of deep trouble and great opportunity uh, to make change? Okay, I say this because I was one, not to disparage any group. I often liken politicians to 15-year-old girls because I was one. And we respond to money, peer pressure, and attention. <laughs> Most of the people in this room don't have enough money <laughs> to, to have a lot of influence. Uh, but you got some. And we know that when, when tied together, small dollar donations, medium-sized donations, or big money can have an influence on policy. Peer pressure. 
making sure that we are constantly pushing people because we can point to our allies and say, if they're doing it, why aren't you? That peer pressure is not only peer pressure on politicians, but it's also peer pressure on our fellow organizations. Holding organizations to the same standard and saying, why aren't you doing this? If you've got this platform, why aren't you using it? And the third is attention. And that's the most important and most effective way of getting policy changed. The other side tells a lie so often it sounds like the truth. We tell the truth one time, and if we don't get an amen, we stop talking. Or we only talk to each other. And that creates a vacuum, and in that vacuum enters the other side, enters their narrative, their lies, their untruths, but also their sincerity, because they sound like they mean it. We don't lose because we don't have the right message. And, and I, I get really frustrated when people say, oh, you all need better messaging. No, we need to believe our message. And we need to tell our story over and over again with a repetition that exhausts people. People should be afraid to see you coming because they know what you're going to say. <laughs> when that happens, that's when change starts to happen. Because when people are tired of hearing you, that means they've actually finally heard you. And that's how we start to move the ball forward. But we. We give up too fast, or we toil in silence thinking that people already know this. People don't know what you're doing. They know what their lives are like, and their lives are hard. Even in the good times, they're still not sure. And so if we want to do bold versus old, the bold is to tell our story so often and so intentionally and with such repetition that people are sick of it, and they just fix stuff so we'll shut up. Stacy, um, you know, we say this a lot at Color Change, um, the work to translate presence into power and not mistaking visibility and awareness for power. And power being the ability to yes. change written and unwritten rules and to build the type of power that makes all of our lives better. We are so grateful and so inspired for you, Stacy. You are a true blessing. Thank you. thank you and thank you all for joining us in this conversation. <laughs>